Father always said, a proper war banner has two roles, to direct and to inspire. In the chaos of battle, he'd say, you won't march wrong if you keep your flag in sight. Now the orcs have cast down our banners, but Gondor's flag still inspires, even if I see it only in my mind's eye. So long as one Gondorian lives, the white tree still stands tall. We Gondorians called Minas Ethel home, but we cannot claim to have built it. That honor belongs to exiles from the fabled realm of Numenor beyond the Sundering Seas. Wondrous architects, they fashioned this city of marble to reflect the moonlight and glow with an inner warmth. But the city's beauty and light drew the ire of the Witch King, who has long sought revenge on Gondor. I wonder if the elves have mundane objects as we do, for even their common containers and vessels seem uncommonly fine. This artifact was once part of a table setting given as a gift centuries ago. The other parts were broken when one of Mordor's many ground tremors knocked them off a shelf. How I wish my predecessors had saved the broken shards. That's a puzzle I'd like to reassemble. Elven things deserve to last. Gondorian folk tales abound with drakes, lesser versions of the great dragons who supposedly slumber under the earth. Yet here in Mordor, I've seen them with my own eyes, though from a safe distance, and they are nothing like the storybooks say. They are lethal hunters of the air, rapacious and cruel, apt to torment their prey before eating it. This scale, taken from a drake carcass we found in a ground cave, gives some sense of their size, and how strong they must be to carry such weight aloft. The orcs are obsessed with rings, more so than coins or jewelry of equal value. They snatch them from prisoners immediately, and what happens to these rings is anyone's guess. We rarely find orcs actually wearing them. This pipe is purported to be the creation of hobbits, a sort of halfling that lives beyond our reckoning in the north. I wonder at the strange notion of full-grown adults who scarcely reach my waist in height. But after what I've seen in Mordor, a hobbit would be a welcome sort of strange. Though I don't think a hobbit would last long in Mordor. Gondor has faced the Witch King before and he's had a vendetta against Minas Ethel ever since. This coin depicts the victor, Aena, last king of Gondor. Generations ago, Aena led an army that routed the Witch King and sent his army fleeing to Angmar. But our victory turned hollow when our king grew prideful. The Witch King challenged Aena to single combat, and Aena rode eastward from Minas Tirith, never to be seen again. It takes a nation to defeat such evil, not just one man. Each city in Gondor administers its own justice in all but the most important cases. And in my lifetime, we've always handled legal matters in Minas Ethel. When I was a girl, I recall my father being much occupied with mercantile disputes and other legal affairs. Then the orcs came, and matters of justice yielded to matters of survival. The Red Arrow is one of Gondor's most treasured symbols, though few know just what it symbolizes. When our need is dire, we can present the arrow to the men of Rohan, and they are bound by ancient pact to ride to our aid. We should have used it in the early days of the siege, but the orcs encircled us so quickly, and Rohan is too far away. In the Great Hall of Minas Ethel, we didn't just safeguard the treasures of our past, we kept our present there as well, an archive of all our official correspondence with the capital. I used to file away missives from Minas Tirith after my father had read them. This was a weekly task at first, but as our surroundings grew more dangerous, scrolls like this one became more rare. I wonder whether there were promises of aid that the orcs intercepted, plans for relief that we never saw. When Aena didn't return from his confrontation with the Witch King, word of his fall spread like wildfire across Gondor. 
The Witch King's forces were regrouping, rapidly seizing lands once under Aenar's rule. Some regions fell so quickly that letters sent by the first ruling steward of Gondor, Mardil, never reached their destinations. For generations we stored the unread letters here, destined to remain forever sealed. We know those lost Gondorians will never claim their letters, but we keep them to honor their memory. I wonder what will become of the last few letters I sent on my father's behalf. The elves esteem delicate finery in all their arts, and the crystals in this artifact glow softly, even in a pitch black room. I know this firsthand because I'd often sneak into the Great Hall and read by crystal light when everyone thought I was safely in bed. The Sea of Nuln is home to beasts we can scarcely comprehend, but from time to time clues about their existence wash up on the shore. Our patrols found this fossilized squid beak years ago. If it is proportional to the smaller squids that fishermen sometimes catch, the sea creature would be several hundred feet long. Such a monster is the stuff of nightmares, proof that this world hides horrors far worse than the orcs. It's easy to dismiss the orcs as brutish, but that demeanor masks a cunning and cruelty well suited for warfare. Their weapons likewise seem brutish, but make no mistake, they know their purpose. One sharp blow to the head will split your skull, whether it comes from Gondorian steel or orcish pig iron. This artifact, a chunk of moonstone, was our last acquisition before the orcs came. A scout found it still smoldering out in the fields where it fell to earth from the moon overhead. I am far from superstitious. But even I wonder whether this bit of fallen moonstone was meant to serve as an ill omen for the disaster that followed. Some orcs are self-styled marauders who crave riches more than other orcs. Greed, not bloodlust, motivates them, and unlike most other orcs, they wear jewelry such as this ring to mark their status. We obtain this ring from a dead marauder, so we've no idea of its history though it seems Numenorian. If only we knew where the Marauders find treasures like this ring. There's so much we could learn. The last King of Gondor, Aena, challenged the Witch King himself in the heart of Angmar. Armored for war, not ceremony, he left his crown behind when he rode to his fate. We hold it in trust for the day when a King of Gondor will return to wear it. Though we need a future king with enough sense not to confront the Witch King alone. By reading the history and peoples of Gondor, every child receives countless lessons in our realm's history. Our kings and heroes, our battles and triumphs. Doubly so for those of us who grew up on Gondor's frontiers. The teachers meant well. They were trying to inspire us. But all the tales of Gondor remind us how exposed we were to the threat of Mordor. Minas Ethel never had the grand dramas and pageantry of Minas Tirith itself, but we had simple arts like music to give us the solace of home. When all around us lies in shadow, a simple folk song or pleasing dance was a ray of sunshine. I wonder if such music will ever be heard again. To an orc, grog is strong drink for their bellies, but it's also medicine for their wounds, and so combustible that it may even be fuel for their war machines. Few Gondorians dare drink it, lest we start to behave like the orcs. Still, it is worth studying. Baranor has some ideas about a poison that, when mixed with grog, can disable or even kill the strongest orc. Gondor's preferred order of battle with variations is a chart depicting how an army should be organized, from the frontline infantry to the cooks and teamsters in the rear. Whenever I study it, I'm amazed at what it takes to send an army to war. Details down to the number of cobblers and farriers for each column of soldiers. Such matters of supply seem mundane, until you're under siege, desperately fighting and quarter rations. 
Then, you're eager to pay attention to logistics. I believe this plate is of Easterling manufacture. The ceramic and the style of decoration is a sort unknown to me or anyone I've shown it to. I know that the Easterlings from beyond the Sea of Rune have never been friends to Gondor, and their war chariots and wain wagons are fearsome indeed. But I should like to meet one up close when battle is not at hand. No matter how fierce they are, they're still men, not Uruks or other minions of the Dark Lord. My first drill instructor told me, trust in your training, not your armor. Even a finely wrought plate can buckle under a hard enough blow, but a skilled warrior can evade that blow so it never lands in the first place. Now Minas Ethel has buckled under. Some blows are impossible to evade. So we do the next best thing. Stand back up again, wounded as we are. Gondor's roots are literal ones, for our realm is intertwined with the White Tree, our greatest symbol and inspiration. Isildur himself gave our people the sapling that would grow into the White Tree, and it survived attacks from Sauron, plagues, and multiple transplants as Gondor's borders shifted in war. Today, the White Tree stands in our capital, Minas Tirith, though it will not blossom again until the King returns, as my father once said. Numenor was an island in the Sundering Seas to the west, the greatest realm of men before it sank beneath the waves. Few survived that calamity, mostly pioneers keen to settle what we now call Middle-earth. We Gondorians have often sought inspiration in what we know of Numenor, and many a young soldier would come to touch the brow of this helmet, wondering what great battles in far-off lands its owner must have seen. We Gondorians are a seafaring people. Though our ships ply the coastlines and rivers, rarely venturing into the open sea. Yet it was not always so. Our ancestors, the Numenorians, and their elven allies sailed to other lands in ships like this model. Sailors even claim it's possible to sail so far into the ocean that land is too distant to see in any direction. Hard to imagine. So I suppose I'll have to see it for myself someday. I believe this statue depicts Gladriel, an elf queen from a legendary forest beyond Gondor. I found scant reference to her in our books, but I know her name means Tree Maiden, and she's said to have hair of gold and silver. She was an elven monarch of the First Age. What wonders she must have seen when the world was so young. Some see rings like this as mere adornment, decoration for one's finger. Yet this ring marks its wearer as a Lord of Gondor, the line of Hamasir. Its filigrees form a seal that marks correspondence as surely as a signature. This ring may be all that's left of Hamasir's nine. I know they perished when Minisethal fell. When a ring has symbolic significance, it is far more powerful than ordinary jewelry. Those who live in Gondor's lowlands could easily forget how close to Mordor Minas Ethel was. Few of Gondor's people devote more than a moment's thought to its borders, or what lies beyond. For them, the threat of Mordor is distant indeed. Minas Ethel's bookshelves cannot compare to the great libraries of Minas Tirith, but they're still the biggest collection of knowledge for miles in any direction. As a girl, I thrilled at the wisdom gathered here. Everything from histories to poetry to cookbooks from a bygone age. This one, Tales of Farthest Umbar, was a childhood favorite. Stories of daring from pirates of old. Real corsairs are far less noble than these tales make them out to be, I'm sure. But they can't be as cruel as the orcs. Not every author seeks to inspire. Some seek to instruct. So it is with Contrivances of Carpentry, by Pelwyn of Lossenach. I spent many an hour tracing the wondrous diagrams within this tome. Instructions for building everything from hobby horses to windmills to catapults. I wonder sometimes who taught more Prentice Carpenters. 
Pelwyn or his book. This ore comes from a longboat that washed ashore in the Bay of Belfalis, and it surely passed through many a Corsair's hands before finding its way inland, where I espied it atop a merchant's cart years ago. I have often wondered about the hands that rode it to sea. Were they the calloused hands of a slave, or those of a dashing Corsair of Umba? I suppose I'll never know. The ability to scry, to see beyond the limit of ordinary vision, has always fascinated us. Those who claim to scry say pools of still water held in an antique bowl can foresee Mordor's many dangers, or reveal a glimpse of fair Gondor itself. But the bowl lacks the range or clarity of the Palantir, and I wonder whether it shows us anything beyond what we might wish to be true. I never dared to break the seal on this scroll, though I often wanted to. I found it in a dust-covered box with a label marked Maps of Southron Trade Routes. Berenor is a Haradrim, so perhaps this scroll has a map of his homeland. Breaking the seal is strictly forbidden for those who aren't Lords of Gondor, and as much as I'm curious, I know my father would not approve. Men and orcs have clashed for centuries. In living memory, the greatest battle between them took place near Long Lake, where men, aided by elves and dwarves, battled the orcs and goblins of Moria. The free folk won the day, and some accounts claim that eagles of the Misty Mountains swooped down onto the battlefield, casting the orcs down from the cliffs and mountains where they stood. Seems a fanciful tale. I saw no eagles overhead when Minas Ethel fell, though we did have Talion and his strange powers. We would have welcomed aid from anywhere, even the skies. The lamps of Eregion illuminate a room with a soft glow, one that leaves only the most tenuous of shadows, a light that seems willing to turn corners and reach further than it ought. When we stored these lamps in the Great Hall, I would light them for an evening every midwinter just to ensure they still functioned. They cheered me so much that I always resolved to do so more often. But then I'd forget or put it off. How I miss their light now. The elves of the distant north have long been named among Gondor's allies, though I've never seen one in person. This cloak is as light as the morning fog on the shoulders. I tried it on once and its colors seem to shift and blend as the light changes. How meager the product of our looms is when compared to elven handiwork. The orcs are neither the only denizens of Mordor, nor the first. Easterlings and Haradrim have settled here from time to time, often at the Dark Lord's invitation. They are scarce today, but one can still find their strange artistic carvings scattered in places from Nern to the city of the Corsairs. Gondor's artisans rival the elves in their dedication, if not their skill, none more so than our weavers. Paint on a wall or canvas will fade in time, but thread retains its vibrant color for centuries. The Numenorians taught our people the art of the loom generations ago, and it is a talent we've nurtured ever since. Our tapestries immortalize our greatest triumphs, but it seems there's always another enemy to darken the horizon. Minas Ethel is on Gondor's frontier, so we have few occasions for the grand balls and masquerades that are surely common events in the capital city. Fine dresses like this one are worn for ceremony. Funerals and weddings, mostly. Not for lordly entertainment. I wonder if the noble families of Minas Tirith spared a thought for us, holding all of Mordor at bay while they danced. My earliest memories are of being nestled under blankets as my mother showed me the illustrations in a storybook about Loki the Larrikin, whose mischief always ended in disaster, though she was always one step ahead of her stern governess. 
I found the book tucked away years later after I learned to read. And I was surprised to learn that the storybook was full of little morality plays, not the comic tales my mother told. I wonder why she did that. I've never seen a warg, but books and traveling hunters have told me plenty. The goblins of the north can ride wargs as the men of Rohan ride horses. Their howls can be heard leagues away, and their senses are keen enough to track even a ranger. What makes a warg truly fearsome is that they hunt in packs of a dozen or more. Categors are more dangerous, but they travel in smaller numbers. A feeble blessing, that. To most Gondorians, this midnight urn is a simple pot of clay. But to the denizens of Minas Ethel, it represented shared sacrifice that only those who live on the frontier understand. For centuries, the name of every able-bodied resident of Minas Ethel was placed in the midnight urn, and at sunset a name was drawn. That person would have to patrol the city's walls until sunrise. The task was ceremonial once we had a professional army, but that made it no less important. From our earliest days, it was always a neighbor watching from the walls. I was ten the first time they drew my name, and I've never been prouder, though I could barely see over the parapet. This artifact was a gift from Gondor's other frontier, the long beaches of Unthalus along Gondor's distant shores. Their lord, Galasgil, sent us this ceremonial bowl with water from the river Morthond, and we kept the bowl long after the water had evaporated. I've often daydreamed of visiting Unthalus. I think I'd like it better than the capital city of Minas Tirith. There is too much of the frontier within me to be happy living in settled lands. On the last day of each year, our people toast the setting sun, thereby seeking good fortune for the coming year, and ensuring the sun will rise the next morning, if the folk tales are to be believed. The lords of Minas Ethel used this goblet for the toast of the final sunset, ever since Isildur himself founded the city back in the Second Age. We performed the toast every year without fail, though it availed us little when the horde of orcs arrived at our doors. We know little of the Harajan, mostly folk tales told around the campfire. The stories say they are fierce, pitiless warriors, as cruel as the orcs and as stern as the southern mountains beyond which they hail. Those folk tales convince many a Gondorian child to behave, but I cannot reconcile them with what I see in the only Harajan I know, Berenor. He is fierce in battle and stern when needs must, but cruel? Never. The Analex of Ruvenir is a collection of advice from a long-ago Gondorian swordsman. It includes a series of exercises he guaranteed would lead to triumph in every duel. Like all young Gondorian soldiers, I studied the Analex a great deal, and I learned two key things. One, Ruvenir's swordsmanship was undoubtedly better than his penmanship. And two, in Ruvenir's time, duelists were far more courteous than the Orcs of Mordor. War ignores such niceties. It is a fundamental truth of Mordor. The Orcs have been here far longer than men. Far longer than the Dark Lord himself, even. This place belongs to them, and in their own way, the Orcs revere their heritage. We found this sword in a crude shrine, after all. Yet imagine what the Orcs and Mordor could become if freed of the Dark Lord's corruption. But some things were lost forever. It has long been customary for the people of Minas Ethel to offer an amphora of water or wine to any visitor from beyond our walls. Such travelers were rare, especially recently, and making the trek to the frontier almost guaranteed a thirsty guest. But when our need was greatest, no one from Gondor came to our gates, thirsty or otherwise. There are no dwarves in Mordor. At first glance, this land would seem to suit them. Plenty of stone for carving and ore veins to mine. This shield belonged to a dwarf from another age who did come to Mordor, though not as a craftsman nor a miner. 
Now that Minas Ethel no longer contains the orcs within Mordor, the dwarves will have to put down chisel and hammer and pick up their shields once more. Minas Ethel held many treasures far grander than this necklace, though none more precious to me. When I was a little girl, I would sneak into the Great Hall and take this necklace from its locked cabinet, thanks to a loose latch that only a child's hand could reach. For hours, I would admire myself in the mirror, imagining myself an elegant lady of Gondor, much like my mother must have been. My father caught me eventually, but as punishment, I received only a lecture. Perhaps he didn't mind seeing his daughter in such finery. This statement of stewardship reads like a mundane description of lawmaking, but it is one of our most treasured documents. Gondor is a realm of law, not of kingly pronouncements. Since the disappearance of Aena, our last king, Gondor has thrived under the guidance of ruling stewards, each a lord of Minas Tirith. The steward's office is hereditary, and its decrees are law, unless a king someday returns to Gondor's vacant throne. And even then, I'm not sure what use we'd have for a monarch, save to keep the cushion on the throne warm. I do not fear the orcs, but in the deep of night I will admit this. I fear their drums. An orc can be defeated in battle, his threat can be walled off or outmaneuvered. But the low rumbling of the drums, that cannot be halted by any artifice of man. Those drums are the heartbeat of their factories, and every beat marks the orcs' relentless advance. We seized these drums in a raid, and I locked them up in the Great Hall so that no orc could ever play them again.